Hi, my name is Ellen Nakashima. I'm a reporter with the Washington Post. And I'd first like to thank CNAS for inviting me to take part in this fifth annual conference, which is a very timely one. And the topic we're here to discuss today, cyber threats and national security, is, as we can see from the headlines, one that is only growing in relevance. But it's also one that is often difficult to grasp, speaking as a layperson, because things cyber happen in the unseen, and policies are shaped quietly, often obscured by layers of classification or jargon. And so the debate is very often abstract. But we have a distinguished panel of experts today here to help us pierce through that fog. And uh, I thought we will we'll begin by introducing the panelists. We'll do 40 minutes of panel discussion and then open it up for questions. Um, and as we do the panel, I'd like people to feel comfortable with just, you know, jumping in. So I'll start with uh, my left, the Honorable Rand Beers, Undersecretary for the National Protection and Programs Directorate, Department of Homeland Security. He oversees the policy and operational functions for the NPPD. He's a former Marine who served in Vietnam, former diplomat and State Department official who has also served on the National Security Council under four presidents. And he served as co-leader of the DHS transition team for the Obama administration. To my right, I have Robert Butler, the, Department, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Cyber and Space Policy at DOD, a retired Air Force officer and information operations warrior who has also worked in industry, has an MBA from the University of Maryland, Maryland and a minor in Spanish, I see. He is responsible for providing cyber policy advice and support to the Secretary of Defense and other senior DOD leaders. And on my far left is Dr. Kristen Lord, Vice President and Director of Studies at CNAS and a former fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies Program at Brookings. She's also former Associate Dean at George Washington University's Elliott School of International Affairs and is co-author with Travis Sharp of CNAS of the new report America's Cyber Future, Security and Prosperity in the Information Age, which everyone should get their hands on. It's a collection of 14 outstanding papers on the topic with noted experts such as Jim Lewis, Mike McConnell, former DNI, Gary McGraw, and Joe Nye. And to my far right, we have Max Kelly, former Chief Security Officer of Facebook. He built and managed the Facebook security team. He's a former FBI senior computer forensics examiner, and a regular speaker at security conferences. He has keynoted both Black Hat Europe and DEF CON. So clearly, it's a panel with a breadth of experience in all quarters. And now, I'd like to open with a basic question um, that I see in, in cyber, which is the difficulty in fashioning effective ways to deal with the cyber threat because we, the public, do not know the scope of the problem. And there's a disconnect between what we hear and what we experience. We hear dire proclamations. We're at cyber war and we're losing. The DOD's networks have been probed or scanned millions of times a day. We've lost a trillion dollars worth of, international, of intellectual properties. Yet life goes on. So what is the most significant damage that can plausibly happen to us? and that would alter our way of life? And, and in what context would it happen? It, is it sabotage of a nuclear plant? Breakdown of a financial system? How about we start with, with you, Bob? Okay, thanks, Ellen, and thank you to CNAS for the opportunity to join the panel today. Um, from, the, uh, from the Department of Defense perspective, let me talk a little bit about the context of how we look at cyberspace and cyberspace policy. Um, as I think many of you know, the department has a fairly big enterprise, 15,000 networks, 7 million computers, over 4,000 installations. And as we continue to work around the world, whether it be in Afghanistan or humanitarian relief operations, the dependence upon information technology continues to grow. So at one end of the spectrum is this increasing dependence upon uh, information communications and technology. Um, at the same time, we see a, a growing array of actors 
that are involved with, uh, with cyberspace activity, not always uh, aligned with, uh, with U.S. interests, uh, which creates challenges for us as we move forward in time. Um, as we work through that, that context, we're, we, we have come to the conclusion that, yes, there are vulnerabilities that we need to deal with, um, and we need to deal with them now, and we need to continue to, to move forward um, in a posture that allows us to continuously innovate and take advantage of technology, but at the same time mitigate those risks. Um, from that vantage point, then, uh, we, we set the context for an environment where we see continuous breach of networks and uh, an, an opportunity, then, to work from where we are with threats that manifest themselves with uh, exploitation activity today to what we would consider some very challenging, um, uh, some significant challenges down the road with regards to disruptive activity. Um, and that's, uh, I think, pr uh, primarily where our focus is in DOD as we move forward, is ensuring that we can operate in effectively in, ci in cyberspace, um, especially in the areas of command and control and uh, the key functions that allow us to meet the needs of the nation. Do you see anything that would pose an existential threat in cyber? <coughs> Well, in, ter in terms of what we see today, we see a lot of different actors, and uh, you're constantly assessing both intent and capability of those actors. Um, we're, it's not, a, you know, we're not specify or you know directing our efforts on uh, just an actor or a particular event, and uh, I think we we in DoD have a culture of planning for a variety of scenarios. And, and what is the most dire of those scenarios? <laughs> I will not, I, Helen, I, you know, I'd be happy to, to kind of get into um, uh, scenarios uh, at other times, but to, it depends upon the, you know, exactly the context of where you're going with regards to the scenario. In one case, if you're thinking about supporting homeland security, I mean, certainly we're going to follow the lead of DHS as we look at domestic response. Um, if we're talking about looking at environments elsewhere, you know, how do we operate effectively in Afghanistan, it's a very different uh, okay. set of uh, set of ideas. Okay, uh, Rand, what do you see as the most damaging scenario that could well, disrupt our way of life? Recognizing that, that DHS is focused primarily on critical infrastructure and key resources within the United States, and I want to accept the, the national security of the military community in answering this because they do their own uh, uh, protection uh, and planning. Um, we're obviously worried about uh, something that would uh, cause a piece of cr critical infrastructure to be unable to operate and to be unable to operate for a prolonged period of time in, in the sense that, that it therefore affected uh, the economy uh, overall. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been a lot of uh, scenarios that people uh, in the private sector have written about uh, which have uh, a degree or, or, or not uh, of actual credibility, but I think that, that those kinds of scenarios that have, have been painted are representative. Have we seen any of those scenarios? No. Have we seen p potentialities of some of th those scenarios? Possibly, but I don't even want to. I don't want to give the sense that we've actually seen them because we don't know what the intent of the individuals that prosecuted those. What do you want to call them? Reconnaissance efforts. Uh, we don't know what their intent actually was. So uh, they may or they may not have been uh, been one of those things. But I don't think we've seen those yet. What we want to do, obviously, is figure out how best uh, to pre prevent. Uh, those kinds of events occurring to our critical infrastructure. Uh, that's what we've been doing uh, on a private voluntary basis with the private sector. Uh, that's what the cyber legislation that the administration has proposed uh, is about trying to, to build a stronger uh, uh, way in which we might be able to protect that. Um, and we've spent a lot of time working with our partners at Defense in terms of both doing that with respect to the federal government and thinking hard about doing that in the private sector. Uh, this is a this is a uh, something that that um, uh, DHS may have the lead for in the private sector, but it's clearly working with their partners in defense. Okay, let me just ask you one thing: Do you think this scenario of a meltdown of the financial system, cascading failures across Wall Street and beyond, is is plausible? 
given that maybe the only actors with the capabilities or sophistications who take that on probably don't have a motive for, to do so. I think, I think you answered your own question okay. there. I think that uh, it is hard to come up with a scenario in which uh, uh, the interdependence of the globe uh, uh, economically doesn't act as an inhibitor to destroying the financial system, except in the possibility in which we were moving in the direction of nation-state war. And that would, would represent a different scenario. But even there, even there, in the old sense of conventional warfare uh, that we used to talk about, uh, it's not to the advantage. When we talked about nuclear war scenarios, it was more uh, talked about because we, we were operating under uh, the, the idea of mutual assured destruction. Mm -hmm. um, that would have left a pretty devastated globe as a result of that. We thought about it. We planned for it. Great. It never happened. Good. I want to come back to that point later, but I'd like Max maybe to weigh in on this if you have any thoughts. Uh, sure. I think <clears throat> I, I definitely agree that there's been a lot of uh, <laughs> private individuals talking about different scenarios and planning. And to me, when I hear when I read them, it reminds me a lot of Y2K issues in 1997. Um, in that people are building a hype around this Armageddon that is probably not going to happen, that uh, they're using it to help sell some of their consulting services. And it's not really focused on, on the real issues that we have. When I look at uh, what real cyber warfare scenarios are going to be, I think they're going to be very much like cyber criminal scenarios in that they're largely covert. They're, uh, if they're actual actions, they're very targeted actions. They're not necessarily wholesale actions. And there are specific motives for doing those things. And I think from a scenario planning standpoint, you can look back and say, there's a technological issue that needs to be addressed, obviously, because that's the medium under which this is occurring. But the same types of motivators that have always occurred behind warfare are there for this type of warfare as well. And your scenario should encompass going after those issues as much, if not more, than the technical issues. Hmm. Okay. Well, that would also seem to uh, raise questions of who should be going after what types of activities when, when we see, for instance, Maybe we see penetration of, of a financial system. Do we treat that as a criminal event for the FBI, an intelligence event, uh, or, or something that even you know, DOD needs to respond to? I think it's multidimensional. It's all of those things. Uh, right. there's, there's an element where the FBI needs to determine if there's a criminal aspect to it that, that needs to happen. There's the FBI and um, CIA's intelligence work around probably that same event. And there has to be a DHS. Uh, response and a DOD response to determine if there's a larger environment that this action occurred in. Certainly what we've seen to date requires all three. There's nothing to suggest that any one of the partners would be uh, not have a reason to be there to assist in dealing with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kristen, what about evolving threats? Uh, those from non and those from non-state actors. Your report talks about the increasing degree to which it's possible to gain access to sophisticated technologies on the black market, about the increased use of artificial intelligence and weapon systems. How and where do you see this threat evolving? Absolutely, and I wonder if I might be able to put this in context a bit first, Ellen. We haven't talked yet about the range of threats that exist, so if mm -hmm. I, I might, I'll just spend a minute talking about this. And first, let me say that we have people in the room who are bona fide cybersecurity experts, Gary McGraw, Roger Hurwitz, uh, uh, and others. But for the last uh, year or more, along with our co-chairs, Mike McConnell, Joe Nye, Peter Schwartz, and uh, Bob Kahn, Travis Sharp and I have been talking to a wide group of people from the government, like these kind of folks here, from the private sector, from NGOs. And we've been sort of scouts for the rest of us who don't understand cybersecurity and try to go out into this forest and meet with the, the natives and learn their customs and some of their language. And we'd like to come back and explain to you what we think we have learned. Um, and having done that, you know, more than 200 interviews over the last year, uh, let me explain to you how, how we see it. Um, first of all, and, and all this is from a national security perspective, first of all, there's cyber crime, and this is a tremendous problem, but Granny getting her credit card number stolen is not a national security problem. What is a national security problem is if that level of uh, crime happens to such an extent that it starts to undermine confidence in the internet 
what that would do to our economy, what that would do to our society, that starts to become a national security threat. There is the incredible loss of intellectual property that's going on. The loss of intellectual property by any individual company is not a national security threat. It is to the extent that it's a defense contractor. If you are uh, Lockheed Martin and this is code having to do with the Joint Strike Fighter, that's a special case. But in particular, no particular company tends to have enough intellectual property to present a strategic threat to the United States. However, if that sapping of intellectual property becomes so severe that it starts to undermine the very basis of American economic power, which is our innovation, that in, in the medium term, in the long term, really becomes perhaps one of the most serious national security challenges posed by cyber threats. And then when we get into the more traditional sphere of, uh, of national security, it is almost impossible to imagine any future conflict not involving a cyber dimension whether it involves uh, trying to attack command and control, uh, whether it, cyber attacks are launched more along the lines of the Stuxnet attack. It, it's hard to imagine uh, this not being a component in the future on the offensive side, on the defensive side. It, it's unimaginable. And at the very high end, we know that tens, if not hundred, into the hundreds of states are developing cyber capabilities so that we all hope there won't be another major war between nation states, but it's impossible to imagine that the next major war between nation states won't include a cyber component. And so it's incumbent on all of us to think through on both the offensive and the defensive side what that would look like, what the implications are. And we know that major nation states these gentlemen won't name them, but I, but I will. Uh, Russia and China, in particular, are developing some, some very uh, sophisticated capabilities. And we don't know the intent. Certainly, we are not at war in any kind of imminent conflict with either of these countries. But if we look over the longer span of history, and some of us in the room are recovering political scientists, we need to factor in these capabilities looking forward. Now, to get to Ellen's question about evolving threats, one of the very interesting things that Travis and I found in our research is that folks in the government were quite focused on um, state actors, especially powerful state actors that are developing asymmetric capabilities. People more in the technology community were pointing out to us, however, just the incredible diffusion of capabilities to non-state actors and how even small, relatively small actors, but not very powerful actors, even individuals, could really create quite a lot of damage and, and wreak quite a lot of havoc. And what I think we're particularly worried about going forward is the most sophisticated capabilities marrying with the most malicious actors. And then increasingly, these two can find each other um, more and more easily. And on the internet, there are even black markets where you don't even need a lot of knowledge to buy these capabilities. You can kind of fill out something that looks like an order form uh, and check off what you need. And this is, I think, over the long term, it is quite um, a challenge. And, and Greg Rattray and Jay Healy have a great piece in our volume about the rise of non-state actors. And they talk about the, the rise of unholy alliances and how uh, what we might see in the future increasingly are states marrying with criminal organizations, uh, marrying with just individual hacktivists out to make a buck. Or I, I think we, we've seen uh, increasingly uh, ideological groups like the anonymous group uh, that was uh, going after uh, some targets on the Marine Base in Quantico, for instance, that are trying to achieve a political or an ideological objective. And they have very powerful tools at their disposal. Uh, so Max would be better uh, positioned to speak about some of the technological trends with cloud computing, the spread of mobile devices and whatnot. But those are some of the things that we found in our research. OK, great. Terrific. Uh, I, I wanted to move for a minute here to the issue of defending the homeland um, and what the government's role should be in defending what is primarily, as we all know, a, a private network of computer systems. So we all know by now that DHS has the lead in, in uh, protecting or helping to protect the private sector, and that DOD stands ready to assist. Last fall, you, you signed a memorandum of agreement to, to collaborate. But there's ambiguity in that assist role. Uh, Bob and Rand, in what areas would DOD, particularly NSA and Cyber Command, be called on to help DHS in assisting the private sector? Is it only after a breach is detected or can the government help in the detection of incoming malware that might target a particular plant? What about neutralizing that malware? And is there a framework for when intelligence or military authorities would be used? 
so I'll start and then uh, uh, Rand can chime sure. in. Um, since we signed the uh, memorandum of agreement, we've really been focused on looking at ways that we can take the competencies that we have in the department, best use them inside of, uh, of this broader question. So that takes the range uh, from operational kinds of planning that we're doing today with DHS into the area of capability development. A great example is working through technical assistance to DHS as we develop and continue to refine the National Cyber Incident Response Plan. DHS lead um, the National Security Agency as well as the Defense Cyber Crime Center, which has a, a tremendous capability in its own right, providing uh, support to DHS efforts that, that take you into the realm of forensics and analysis, um, as well as supporting in the planning, you know, planning activities in general. Um, Cyber Command, as it continues to grow, uh, again, available and uh, postured to provide um, help and risk mitigation support. Um, and as we've done this, we've, we've set up this agreement. I think uh, it starts with a sharing of, of personnel. Um, it also includes the uh, idea of co-locating some folks together uh, through a joint coordination element that allows us to begin to synchronize and see each other's competencies in different ways. Um, as we move forward in time, it's a really driving towards more of a, a vision of how we can help not only in the planning side, but also sharing uh, our talents with regards to capability development. So how do we move forward to help on the sensing side? How do we move forward to help link um, a much more proactive way of supporting the United States government, and specifically the Homeland Mission? Yeah. At this point, you, you would need new authorities if you wanted to move forward on the on the actual active sensing side? Or, right. Or in term, yeah, yeah. We have the dot .mil domain, and we have everything covered under our DOD authorities there. But as we work with, uh, with DHS, we are really taking um, cues from the Department of Homeland Security and enabling and supporting them uh, within the resource constraints that they have, we have, and, and uh, looking at what they can execute within their own authorities. Thank you, Rand. I think that's, that's a good uh, overview. What I would say is um, there's no question that, that DHS is a more recent uh, arrival in the field of cybersecurity, and there's a lot of, of a wealth of information, uh, technology, uh, and personnel uh, in the Defense Department that are extraordinary extraordinary help to us in getting started. Some of the problems that we deal with are different, but that doesn't mean that the expertise that the DOD can bring to the table isn't helpful in thinking about new problems as well as taking on old problems and, and taking some ideas and solutions that the Pentagon uh, has had. Uh, one of the things that we've discovered, though, and, and this is a very interesting, well, well, we're obviously getting a lot of help. It's ended up, in some ways, in being very much a two-way street, that, that some of the things that we had gotten into before the Defense Department, if you will, had begun uh, to work more closely with us, actually gave us some awareness to some of the problems in the private sector that the, the Defense Department hadn't uh, encountered or, or, or thought its way through. And so uh, this is really uh, a two-way street. I mean, I think one of the examples we have here is a collaboration that we have been working on in the defense industrial base. Now, that's a sector that the Defense Department is responsible for under the 18-sector plan that DHS has overall responsibility. But defense is the sector-specific agency. Going out into the private sector is a different model for the Defense Department than working within the Defense Department. But well, we'd already been out in the private sector. So to some degree, we have some things to add to the things that they have. But, but as, as a number of us have said overall, we are not in DHS trying to recreate the Defense Department capabilities within DHS. But we are uh, certainly willing to learn from and have profited from uh, the technical assistance, the information sharing, and the personnel uh, that the Defense Department is about. One of the things in the legislation that is important to DHS, for example, is to have a hiring authority that parallels the Defense Department hiring authority because theirs is a much uh, uh, freer and more open ability to hire than we currently have. Uh, because when we were created, nobody thought about us needing that, and that's something that would be very beneficial. Not that we're 
or we are going to compete with the Defense Department for hiring those very same people. Um, but more importantly, that, that we, as a whole of government effort, uh, can do a better job populating the, the kinds of expertise that are necessary uh, to deal with this threat. Bottom line, we can't do it without the Defense Department, but it's a team effort. Yeah. We're just building on a, on a couple of points. It really is about um, understanding and partnering, and, and um, not so much in, in, the, in the competitive side. I mean, I look at, for instance, where we're going with next-gen workforce. Um, we actually need much greater expansion in that area. And my sense is uh, DHS, with potentially new hiring authorities, is actually going to help us big time down the road. Uh, we need to build a much larger base of, of uh, capability. And not only within the public sector, we've got to create cross-flow programs. I mean, personally speaking, coming out of the industry and then back into government service has been great because I, I've been able to see some things very differently than I, than I had uh, when I was just doing government work. Um, so I think it's, uh, it's really important to continue. We talk about the word partnership, but putting action behind partnership is absolutely critical. I wanted to get the uh, private sector perspective in here a little bit. So, Max, you've said that the military and commercial defense against cyber attacks should be unified. What did you mean by that? And does the private sector want or need government's help? Um, <clears throat> on the second question, I think, I think uh, not. It depends on what the help, what form the help comes in. Uh, but I'll get to that. Uh, on, on the first uh, question, I. As Facebook grew, um, we grew very quickly, and we became a target for worldwide actors um, coming against us. And as I started to see the types of attacks that we were fighting against and the types of motivations that our attackers were having against us, uh, I began to, to think about a worldview in which cybersecurity and cyber warfare are actually the same thing. Um, unfortunately, there is a long history of cybersecurity in the private sector that doesn't view what they're doing as fighting a war. And cyber warfare doesn't yet have, I think, an evolved enough doctrine that encompasses working with the private sector. And just a, a semi-technical but not too complex example is if you have a technology company where you have a bunch of servers sitting out there and you have a lot of bandwidth that goes to those servers, there's no direct indication that that's that that's a, a cyber warfare asset, except for the fact that if a state actor or non-state actor who's aligned with, with some state gets access to those computers and that bandwidth, they can suddenly use that to attack anywhere they want to in the world, and it's going to look like it came from you. Um, and there's thinking in cybersecurity about how you should keep people from doing that, but there's not a large enough awareness, and this was my uh, talk I gave last year, about a big motive for people wanting to do that is to just gain access to your systems and sit there because eventually they're going to use them to go after someone else. And um, that's not something that most cybersecurity private sector people would think about or worry about as much as they should. <clears throat> now to the role of government in helping the private sector deal with that. Uh, when I came to Facebook in 2005, uh, coming from the FBI, uh, there were already things going on then, even though it was much, much smaller than it is now, but people were attacking. Um, there was awareness on my part and, and many people in the companies that as we grew, we'd become a larger target very quickly. And I went back to people I knew in FBI, people I knew in government, and said, can you help us out with information? Just what's going on? What do you see? If you ever hear about anyone coming after us, can you, can you let me know so we can figure it out? And for years, the answer was no. Can't give you anything, can't help with anything. Given that was five years ago, there's a lot more awareness now of, of what cyber is, and I guess there's a lot more awareness of what Facebook is. Um, <laughs> but if, you know, if I was starting a small company, and I would still want, want that type of information. By and large, I was referred back to InfraGuard, which um, is an FBI public-private program to share information with industry. When I was in the FBI, I would speak at industry conferences, and I would recommend that people in industry join InfraGuard and submit to it. Then I joined InfraGuard and saw the type of information I was getting and felt very embarrassed. Um, 
And in fact, the last, uh, I was thinking about this this morning, the last InfraGuard notice that I received, and, and not the last one they've sent, but the last one that I decided I didn't need to pay attention to them anymore, was uh, a notice saying that Chinese hackers were becoming very active and may start attacking American assets. <laughs> and uh, this was in 2006. And I thought, hmm, I, I can probably get better information elsewhere. Uh, when I, when I ended up speaking with people who ran InfraGuard, and in particular the, uh, the uh, head of cyber at the FBI at the time, and it's under his purvey, and asked, why aren't you actually putting real information or actionable information there? Or at least putting in a system where InfraGuard can pre-screen people, and then you can determine whether or not you can give them more accurate and, uh, and, and targeted information. Uh, it came back to everything that's important is either under, under investigation or classified. And even if we could declassify it, they felt that they would have issues around giving one company a competitive advantage over another company, uh, to which I suggested just give everyone the same information, and then you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but I think that, that these stories uh, indicate how government typically has decided to put roadblocks in the way of helping the private sector with information. And information is really the thing that the private sector needs more than anything to help uh, uh, mitigate many of the scenarios that we're talking about here. What the private sector doesn't need is, uh, and fortunately there's uh, a strong awareness, I think, of this in, in government right now, is a cookie cutter kind of standardization approach, certification approach to cybersecurity. The problem's so dynamic and so fluid that you really just can't put an ice cube tray of solutions on top of it and hope that, that you can solve the problem. Um, that being said, there are still people who want to do that uh, because it's a comfortable dynamic for how the government's treated security for the last 50 years, still thinking about uh, computers and networks as if they're buildings and bombs when, in fact, they're more like soldiers. Um, but, Bob, you, you've been nodding your head uh, yeah. a lot. Um, especially, could you respond to the point about government not sharing the classified information that industry wants and needs to, to better protect themselves? I keep hearing the same thing today, that it is still an obstacle, and uh, especially even within the DIB, uh, the DIB project, which has been very slow, I guess, to get started. Maybe that's one of the obstacles. Well, I agree with Max. I, I, my, my sense is a, a good role for government is in the realm of building situational awareness across private and public sector. We learn a lot from the private sector as we've collaborated, and um, it starts with information sharing. Um, what are you doing to... So in the defense industrial base, mm -hmm. I mean, we started this back in 2007. We've grown out to, uh, you know, about three dozen companies here where we are now sharing information uh, which helps us with, uh, helps them with understanding a bigger picture, tactics, techniques, and procedures, and some signatures. Um, that program has, I think, been quite successful over the time that it's been in existence, and we're trying now to work to expand that, uh, working with the Department of Homeland Security, now looking at the expansion of that program into other sectors. And again, it can take different venues. It can be worked through arrangements individually with companies, um, but then there's a challenge of, you know, some get the information, some don't get the information. Um, there, there's a recommendation in the CNAS report with regards to a kind of a government clearinghouse fusion approach. Um, we are looking at other approaches with DHS and using the ISACs. Um, so there's many ways of working it, but the general principle of updating uh, our policy and legal basis to allow greater information sharing is one that I think uh, we do have agreement on. So if I could just add one yeah. point there. Um, we have also come to the same uh, realization that the information that we were putting out wasn't particularly helpful. Um, and I'm sorry to say that Max's example was an all too frequent kind of example of the sorts of information. What we have tried to do recently, broadly, but in the cyber area in particular, is to ensure that when we put out some indication of malware, we put out something with it that acts as at least some effort, first order, second order, third order mitigation strategy uh, for dealing with that. The same is true for the industrial uh, uh, control systems that we are, are working with. 
uh, as well. It isn't always the best uh, that can that we can get to, but um, uh, it is it is something that we're embarked upon. And Bob mentioned the financial sector pilot program we have now. The good news is we're embarking on this. The challenge is that it requires a clearance on the other end in order to exchange classified information. That's something we're piloting with the private sector. We're trying to do it more broadly, uh, the, uh, and, and we'll see what the results are. But we're hoping that as we work through the legislation, and if we get to the legislative point, that the ability to share information uh, will be much better, and it will be a two-way street, not just industry sharing with the with the federal government, but the federal government sharing it with industry. Okay. Ellen, I'd be happy to comment on this as well. One of the things we found is that this problem of information sharing is one of the big nuts that has to get cracked if we're going to solve this problem. And it's a big challenge uh, for a couple of reasons. One is simply bandwidth in government. Even if government has information, just getting it out to companies and sharing it, and I mean, it's just as an incredible problem. I mean, who do you share it with? Who do you not share it with? What are the thresholds you have to cross? So that's one very realistic problem. Another, of course, is the whole issue of sources and methods and not exposing sources and methods. Uh, people like Mike McConnell, if he were here today, would say uh, we need to be much more aggressive in terms of clearing people to get information out. Uh, but frankly, the challenge is also on the corporate side. And, and for some very legitimate reasons. Corporations, for quite understandable reasons, don't really want the whole world to know their customers, their competitors, when they have a major security breach. Um, it's something they don't really want you writing about, Ellen. Um, I'm sure you've encountered that. And so they don't really want to talk about it. They certainly don't want to sit in rooms with their competitors and share that information. And then, um, you know, to be really provocative, um, some people we interviewed said, well, you know, we'd be happy to share some information with the government, but we understand their networks aren't so secure. What was it? How many times a day do your networks get probed? Um, and then there are a whole set of questions about legal issues, about liability, about potential violations of antitrust, about if they give information, will that information become available via FOIA requests? So they're just, there's a big thicket that needs to be navigated in order to do this more effectively, um, but it's a big challenge. I, we, we need to move on to, uh, but I wanted to get in one, uh, one line of questions or question around Stuxnet, which I think in the, in the realm of cyber operations was a game changer. I mean, here for the first time was a worm that could target a specific type of equipment in a specific country's nuclear facility. Bob, if a worm like that were to infect a nuclear plant in the U.S., disrupting and damaging the facility, maybe if we had centrifuges causing them to spin out of control, but not causing deaths. Would you consider that a use of force? And assuming you had attribution and it was a nation state, what response would you favor? It's a fairly simple question. <laughs> so, you know, I think we went a long ways um, in uh, the president's promulgation of the international cyberspace strategy to talk about some of the things that we would do related to deterrence and response. Um, as you saw in that document, really a whole of government approach uh, that took you from the areas of openness and innovation to security and resilience. And so um, as you read through that document, we talk about a response, a response that's governed by international law uh, that is not restricted to any specific means, but that is uh, couched in the context of um, um, not only our national interests, but norms that we would develop and would be uh, governed through existing um, laws that we have, law of armed conflict, uh, UN charter, and what have you. So uh, again, a lot of this is contextual. I mean, Max has brought it up, uh, Brand has brought it up. Um, it, we would have to work with the rest of the, uh, the national security community, and again, the direction would come from the president. What if it were created by a terrorist group or maybe even a corporation, an other non-state actor? How would you respond to it then? So one, one of the challenges, of course, we talked about it briefly in threat, the variety of actors. Mm -hmm. um, so within the area of non-state actors, uh, one, of the th uh, one of the areas that we spend a lot of time discussing and trying to move forward on is how do you create deterrence um, within, uh, for those actors that you really don't have um, you know, organizations buying into law? Um, and what, what we come to are, are means where we 
On one end of the equation, we're providing additional protection in our defensive posture. And another end of it is really looking at how we can go ahead and have others adopt with us um, tougher rules on law enforcement for uh, cyber criminal activity and working with other nations to help enforce mechanisms that would be able to pursue non-state actors, criminals, um, as well as you know, looking at um, groups of folks that are, as Kristen was mentioning, uh, involved in collusion of activities. You know, we have partners mm -hmm. and trying to sort through ways that you can prevent and deter at the same time if activity happens from these types of actors to prosecute. I'd like to throw this one over to, to maybe Max, Kristen, Rand. Some said that Stuxnet, in a way, was a very smart tool. It, it bore the marks of lawyers steeped in international law. There was no death, no collateral damage, um, no civilian deaths, um, no regional conflagration, yet it appeared to have delayed Iran's nuclear program by a year or two. So do you think the creation of these increasingly sophisticated cyber weapons such as Stuxnet is a valuable uh, is a valuable tool, a politically palatable method of warfare, or is it ultimately destabilizing? Um, I'll, I guess I'll take that a little bit. I think that uh, the the spread of of cyber tool development is so wide and has so many motivations that uh, it's kind of an automatic arms race in that. All viruses uh, over you know, the last 30 years have gotten progressively more and more advanced. The technological basis upon how they are created and shared and used and what they're used for is more and more advanced. I think that that type of development will continue as long as there are motivating factors for it to do so. And, and crime is a big motivating factor for that. For the specific payload, I think, that you're talking about, um, I won't comment on whether I think it's a valuable or a valid form of warfare or not, because I don't have that uh, under my belt. Maybe you want to, um, but I, or Kristen can. Um, but I think that it is, it's going to happen, and that a defensive posture against those types of attacks would need to be built and maintained. Did you want to? I think there's been a lot said about <laughs> Stuxnet. I don't think that we... And I would concur with Max's <laughs> last thought. We need to make sure that we can defend against those kinds of activities. That's why we've taken it apart, put it back together again, and, and are developing ways to mitigate it. So, yeah, and actually, that, 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 that's actually a great yeah. point, Rain, because that, that is another part of the partnership. Uh, I mean, DHS has been leading the charge on helping, on helping us collectively on Stuxnet uh, in terms of the forensics analysis, and that truly has been a great partnership trying to figure that out. Have you finished your forensic analysis? I think we have. And? <laughs> but no, I say I think we have because these things are such that you're never, you're, you are never safe in saying you're 100% uh, sure. Yes, because that is one of the points that your report raises, Kristen, is that, that when weapons or capabilities such as Stuxnet are released into the wild, you know, probably unintentionally in this case, they can, the risk is they be re reverse engineered and maybe even used against us. So you want to make sure you're doing something to prevent it. Did you want to? Sure. I, I mean, I'll just answer your question. Right. Um, are these tools valuable and are they destabilizing? The answer to both questions to me is quite plainly yes. Um, they're extremely valuable tools, and in many ways, they, they are highly precise, or they can be highly precise. Stuxnet was highly precise, even if Stuxnet 2, 3, 5.0, 100.0 um, is, is not, because it may be used by other actors in, in other ways that we can't predict. Um, so they are incredibly valuable. Um, and they also do less uh, damage. Someone pointed out to me in, in one of the conversations for the report that in the preparation for an actual kinetic conflict, it is not uncommon for us to begin by taking out a power grid. Well, imagine if we could do that, and then when the conflict was over, for instance, say, say in Baghdad, we could have just flicked a switch and suddenly it was working again. That would have been really handy. 
Um, so that, <laughs> these are very, very useful weapons, but they're also very powerful weapons or increasingly will become powerful weapons because I think one of the problems in thinking about cyber threats is that we need to think forward. Um, and there's been a lot of hype and a lot of misunderstanding. Uh, Gary and Nate's chapter, I don't know where Gary is, um, is really great on this in terms of separating what are good examples and what aren't. Stuxnet was useful in a way because it helped people to grasp this in a, in a tangible way for perhaps the very first time, and, and it is a, a real threat. Uh, but in terms of, so, so the question was, uh, were they valuable? Yes. The question, are they destabilizing? Yes, extremely, um, and, and I worry about it quite a lot. They very much favor the offense. Um, they are very much favor uh, those that are weak. Defense is extremely difficult. I mean, there's a, a statistic that um, cyber geeks like to quote all the time, which is, 20 years ago, there, it took about a few thousand lines of code to defend against a cyber attack. Um, and, and now that it's tens of thousands. Uh, um, but it used to take about 120 lines of code for malware, and it's still about 120 lines of code. Um, so the, the benefits to the defense uh, are, or the, the cost of the defense are, are going up. It's, it's easier to attack than to defend. Um, but the, uh, the other point I wanted to make is that there's no transparency. I mean, even in an incredibly uh, difficult nuclear balance, even in the height of the Cold War, we had ways of counting tanks, counting missiles. We knew pretty much uh, how much damage each tank, each missile could inflict. We could count how many there were, and we might not get the numbers quite right, but we could have a fairly uh, rational assessment of what the other guy's capabilities were. And, and, um, and even though we got that wrong, obviously, with the whole uh, missile gap uh, challenge, uh, in cyber, you can't know. You have no idea what you're up against. So we've been told over and over again, the United States is currently in a very active cyber arms race. But one of the reasons is you, you just never know if you're ahead or not. Um, and so it's incredibly escalatory. It's incredibly destabilizing in that sense. I think there are a lot of things the United States and other governments can do around the world in order to tamp that down. But I think it's, it's extremely important that we start to have those conversations now. Thank you. Great. And um, on that note, I think we'll throw it open for questions. If um, you could state your name and affiliation, and, and then your concise question. Um, this gentleman right here, second row. Uh, is there a microphone? OK. Hi. <clears throat> Charlie Dunlap, Duke University. Uh, this is for Mr. Butler and Mr. Beers. Are you all comfortable that there is a good process by which you can go back and forth, if necessary, between a law enforcement regime and a national security legal regime. And as a follow-up to that, does, does anybody on the panel see utility for an international cyber arms agreement? In terms of our ability to go back and forth, I would say uh, it is getting better. It is still very much a work in progress. Uh, but I would also say that at the, at the incident event occurrence, for most of the events, well, for all of the ones that I can actually think of, it's law enforcement first. And then we come with them to do the mitigation, attribution, and, and forensics. So the question you pose is not a question we've had actually practically to answer yet, wouldn't you say, Bob? I think that's right. Uh, one, one of the ways that we actually uh, put life to the response there is uh, we have a standing group, the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force. That, that's kind of a whole of government approach. Uh, DHS is involved as well as the Department of Defense um, under FBI lead, um, where we begin to work through uh, the determination of what, what the activity is and what we need to do next. Um, so I think when, when we look at the partnership with LE and then figuring out, you know, when an event actually be, is more than a criminal event or is moving in a different direction, you already have the partners at the table and you're but working through that. That's part of what the National Cyber Incident Response Plan is supposed to be the initial building block of. And we've, we, we've done it, we've created it, we've practiced it, we're revising it. Uh, in light of Cyberstorm 3 at this point in time. And, and uh, 
it's never going to be done. It's going to be an evolving document, quite frankly, and it should be. Now, now on the second question, I mean, we've just gone through a fairly lengthy discussion about threat and how you begin to understand threat and the challenges with attribution. Uh, our sense, at least uh, from DOD and then kind of as a part of a greater USG team, is that we can make the greatest inroads on the international side with working to develop norms, understanding ways that we can help each other uh, to think about a safe and secure, reliable cyberspace. That's certainly um, cited clearly within uh, where we're going with the international cyberspace strategy. It is part of our approach as we engage the United Nations and other international bodies. It's a, it's a foundational piece for how we build bilateral and multilateral frameworks in this space. It's a key element of where we're going with our thinking with our forthcoming national or our defense cyber strategy. So I think that's really the thrust of where we're headed on the international front. Thank you. Yes. Rachel Oswald, Global Security Newswire. If I could throw it out to the panel to touch on the news that Lockheed Martin recently suffered a cyber attack. I know that not much can be shared, but we were, I'm, I've read that it's probably Chinese in origin. Um, and uh, what would that mean then if this was not a state-sponsored attack, but this was a group of individuals operating on their own? How would the United States prosecute this? So, I mean, so you know, just starting with the, with the dialogue. I mean, um, Lockheed um, has reported intrusion activities. That some of us, the DHS ourselves, are involved with uh, uh, through our defense industrial base arrangements, uh, understanding uh, what has happened. Analysis is ongoing. Um, we stand ready as part of our DIB defense industrial base information sharing program to provide assistance in collaboration with DHS. Um, but as, as we've talked about over the last hour or so, <laughs> the analysis on these activities, uh, first of all, is, is, is challenging. It's diffuse, and, and lots of different pieces have got to be put together. And so uh, from the vantage point of working with Lockheed on this, the question is better directed to Lockheed or the FBI. Um, there is an element uh, within, the, within the information sharing aspects here, where you begin to move from analysis to seeing what can be done with remediation. And I, I think there's two sides of the equation that you have to continually work through, whether you're working this on the public sector side, the private sector side, and determining um, you know, when you reach uh, thresholds that allow you to, to move in much more proactive ways. So that's kind of where we are in terms of generally speaking about you know, our relationship from our, our information sharing program with Lockheed and other defense industrial based partners. And obviously Lockheed doesn't want this to happen again. Yep. So they are very much interested in whatever uh, might help them be better protected than they were as a result of recognizing that they'd been penetrated. So we stand ready to help them in that regard. Uh, we have a Twitter question here, and um, we're looking for a Twitter answer. No, I'm kidding. Can the panel concisely comment on the difficulties of attribution in considering cyber attacks as acts of war? Um. So I, I think Max was starting to allude to this uh, earlier mm -hmm. when we were to talk about you know, how, um, thing, how uh, malware is designed and how it moves through a system. I mean, Typically, uh, as you think about uh, cyber capability that's being developed for, uh, um, for purposes that, um, uh, to harm or to, to create challenges for us, there's intermediate stops along the way in terms of hot points and, uh, and redirection activities, which make it very, very difficult. Um, there are ways, um, both in, uh, across networks, hardware, software, um, to uh, provide a, a, a great sense of, a, of, of uh, anonymous uh, activity that makes the analysis piece very, very difficult. Sometimes you can find uh, marks, watermarks and others that help you. I mean, we have tool sets that try to assist, but today, as I think most of us would agree, attribution is extremely difficult. And that's certainly one of the things that we want to think about internationally, to see whether or not we can build systems in which the ability to uh, hide behind a national border in, in, in a system 
uh, or uh, to jump uh, can in fact be better tracked by, by cooperation with, with uh, those in the international community. Okay, thank you. Yes, that gentleman there in the second room. So uh, I'm here as a geek and a cybersecurity guy. Um, and I'm also from the private sector. Um, and I think the government is way behind. I'm uh, worried about that. And I've been listening to you policy people all day with just, it's astounding. Um, it's really cool to hear what you talk about. So <laughs> I'm, gonna tr I'm gonna try to ask a question in um, what I believe is policy want speech. And let's see if it works, okay? So not along. So by social contract, the state um, gets obedience from citizens in return for protection, right? That's the idea. But the state's not really delivering when it comes to cybersecurity, I don't believe. The U.S. spends, some say, 50 to 100 million a year fighting cybercrime, which is way more than the rest of the world combined. That's cool. But guess what? Google spends more. Google. And so what is your question? So the question is, what, what gives? You know, why are, is there not more focus on cyber crime than there is on cyber war and cyber espionage if all of these things, in fact, share the same root cause? And I'd actually like to hear what Max has to say about this. Uh, OK. I, uh, I have I've sometimes wondered that same thing myself. I think the. Uh, I mean, the government is definitely a little behind, but I think they're, de they're on the right track. They're vectoring in the right direction. Uh, you know, uh, and as an instance, uh, a couple examples were there were very large cases that I brought to FBI um, that were criminal under the Can Spam Act, and they did not pursue them or didn't pursue them very aggressively. Uh, and we ended up pursuing them under civil recourse that we had under the same act and um, found the individuals, prosecuted them, uh, uh, won the cases, very, very large cases. Uh, I think the, the largest one we had statutory damages of $8 billion. Um, the judge thought that that was too onerous, so reduced it to a mere $800 million. Um, <clears throat> and, and those were cases where, where we felt that the enforcement was, was a slam dunk handed the whole case over, and, and it just wasn't something that the Bureau wanted to focus on at the time. To be fair, you know, they had other things going on. Um, I think that part of how the cybersecurity and cyber warfare policies are going to evolve are going to be creating a much stronger awareness on both sides of what the capabilities are and what the priorities are and how uh, sometimes the private route, the private enforcement route, will be best for people, and sometimes the public enforcement route will be best. And a clear agreement, I think, will be made on, on how that happens. Um, that goes back to my, my point from earlier of how cyber warfare and cyber security need to be, become one kind of unified idea of how to, how to deal with it. And I think that um, enforcement action between government and civil criminal and civil, also needs to be uh, more unified. I'd like, I mean, I wish I had a lot more legislation that allowed me to do civil activity against people who are committing cyber crimes, um, because we would have done a lot more. And uh, I think, you know, legislation going forward, if it has that capability, it means that Google or Facebook or Microsoft can be very aggressive in the civil action and probably deter a lot of criminal activity just from that. So, could I, could I just? Can I? Yeah. I think that's a really good question, and that's part of what we are trying to get at with respect to the cyber legislation. One, it's to have the private sector actually share with us when, in fact, there has been a penetration, and do it in a way that they don't feel that their bottom line is jeopardized, but that they do feel that the government will be in a position to do something about it. Secondly. 
We also need to ensure that we actually have enough investigators who can actually do this. And that's an issue as well. And that's part of the personnel side that we're talking about mm -hmm. in the legislation. So there is actually a need there. Dollars obviously follow that. But it can't all be done by the police because you've still got to answer the question about what is the degree of government involvement in the, in the, in the lives and the cyberspace of private citizens in the same way that we ask that question when we talk about things uh, uh, with respect to conventional crime and we talk about uh, police presence and, and how much is um, uh, appropriate, uh, how much is enough. Uh, those are all questions that we're going to answer, have to answer, because we're never going to be able to be 100 percent perfect in this realm. So how do we find that right balance? But we don't have the right balance now. And Max is right. We need this law or something like this law to put ourselves in a better situation to deal with this, because the penalties for cyber criminals are not adequate at this point in time. And we're going to have to fix that. If I, if I could just build on the point. I, I I take the, uh, the critique, but, uh, but I'd also like to push back a little bit. I mean, when we think about what we're doing, not only within DOD, but the United States government, um, there's certainly a huge focus from Howard Schmidt with regards to cyber criminal activity and working with the Department of Justice. Within DOD, we continue to grow our Defense Cyber Crime Center, not only in terms of forensic specialists to support investigations, but also on the training side. We are training people. Um, at unprecedented scales in this area to try to assist in, in dealing with that threat and with the, with the loss uh, of, um, certainly from, from the standpoint of defense, uh, intellectual property. Um, and we are backing that up with dollars as we move forward. Um, do we have a ways to go? Yes, we have a ways to go. But um, there has been a recognition both within uh, the Department of Defense and other departments about the fact that we have to do more from a public sector standpoint, and we are doing more. Thank you. How about one in the back? Um, yes, that gentleman there. Middle, I guess. Hi, Gopal with a reporter with Bloomberg News. A question for Mr. Butler and Mr. Beers. So you said on the Lockheed case that you were still investigating and uh, the challenge, it's a challenging issue and it's diffuse. I was wondering what you're investigating and also, on last week, the Pentagon said that the impact from that uh, intrusion was minimal. So I was wondering how you came to that conclusion that it was minimal if the analysis is ongoing. So DOD does not have the lead on investigating. It's an FBI lead um, working with Lockheed. Um, we know, based on our information sharing arrangements with Lockheed, um, a lot about you know, how the defense industrial base aspects that they manage are affected. And that was the, uh, the reasoning for why we made the ass assessment that we did last week. But right now, it's pretty early, pretty early in the process. So it's hard for us to be able to give you uh, anything, uh, uh, certainly anything definitive, but even, even much information. These things don't, they don't play out that quickly. Think about a normal criminal investigation. You're not usually able to answer within days of the revelation that an event has occurred. Uh, a reasonably full description of what actually happened. That's, that's equally true in cyberspace. Uh, that gentleman back there? No. Yes. Hi, Mike Lazar, uh, one of the 2011 CNAS Next Generation fellows. Um, wanted to ask, getting back to the issue of organization and authorities for defending the homeland, one of the key assets that seems to be left out of the debate is the National Guard. They, have, they seem to have the right mix of authorities, Title 10, Title 32, uh, great congressional support, um, defense support to civil authorities, but they don't seem to be talked about or leveraged or put out front. Instead, you see you know, Marines setting up uh, two stars and three stars to, to do cybercom stuff. Could you talk about that a little bit, the National Guard? So we have within uh, DOD established over the last half dozen years uh, a variety of uh, National Guard units, primarily on the Air National side, where we are taking advantage of uh, expertise in different areas, uh, whether it be in the financial services arena or, or co-locating with an Air National Guard unit, say, out in Redmond, Washington, with uh, companies like Microsoft. Um, our Deputy uh, Secretary Bill Lynn announced in February at the RSA conference the expansion of that program. We're continuing to work to co-locate 
and build guard units um, at innovation nodes around the United States. At the same time, we're working with the Department of Homeland Security with, with Rand's team here on looking at ways that we can leverage them both in, their, in, in the military capacity as well as in supporting homeland. Um, the next steps along the way really drive us into some pilot programs to look at ways that we can do that um, in, in, in thinking about not just what they have been doing, what their expertise is, but how we can better leverage the expertise with, as you said, the different authorities. A good concept uh, for where we are working through that is in the certs. Um, as we look at guardsmen working in state certs and taking advantage, again, of their expertise in helping with fusion activities and information dissemination. And, and we in DHS have already, as a general proposition, been using the Guard to do things like vulnerability assessments. And as this capability builds out in the cyber area, I, can't, I know we will be wanting, uh, subject to the availability of the personnel, uh, seeking to have them uh, uh, be part of our uh, general outreach to the private sector. We'll have uh, one last question. Yes. Hi, this might be a little off subject, but there's a lot of talk about what you're doing with the private sector, but I was wondering about smartphone technology and its ability to be packed, especially as they're being used increasingly by first responders. So what's being done to protect that technology, especially if it's going to be used responding to events such as 9-11? If someone can get into that when they're using them for maps or whatnot and hack into that, what's being done to protect that technology? Well, we're certainly looking for any problems of that nature that, that might be able to, to be dealt with. Um, with respect to the, to the actual cybersecurity within the technology as being built by uh, the, the manufacturers of those, uh, we're certainly trying to create a sense uh, of awareness that they need to think about security as well as uh, uh, the other aspects and value of that. Uh, that ends up uh, being a, a private sector, private manufacturer decision as to whether or not uh, they want to include security within, uh, within their package. I think to the extent that there is disclosure about failures of security in that regard, it places a premium more uh, on them to do something about it. But we in DHS and the Pentagon don't have the authority to tell them that they have to have those security measures mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, their, in their technology. Okay. One mm -hmm. of the uh, areas that we build upon together is, again, pilot programs here and thinking through uh, not just smartphones but mobile devices in general. Um, how do you operate in degraded environments? And we're constantly exercising and running technology pilots in there. So that drives you into technology solutions that take you from the realm of encryption out to other kinds of resiliency concepts. And, and it's truly a partnership uh, with, with DHS and DISCA support, as well as abroad for us on humanitarian relief operations. OK. Um, if that's it, I think thank you very much, everyone, for good questions, lively discussion, and for 